you may be seated. For those of you who are here, we do have some guests here today. We invited a few guests, and I want to say thank you for being here, and thank you for asking. Some of y'all were asking on Facebook, and you were asking on, on a person that texts, hey, are you guys going to be open? Can we do Well, we're not officially open, but we're uh, scattered open. We're a little, little scattered open, so I invited some of you guys, and of course, my mom is here, so I thank God for her, and uh, just uh, having her here is, is wonderful. But I'm here to tell you that every one of us in life have had situations where uh, where we needed Jesus. As a matter of fact, um Tell me something funny. Yesterday, we were Lorenzo and I were here working uh, late, and and uh, in the afternoon we heard this banging. I said, "What is that?" You know, and of course I'm gonna go check it out. And what I found out that Lorenzo says it's probably skaters. Sure enough, it was two guys who were skating. They're using our, our little area here, concrete, and and doing their little skateboard tricks. All right, skateboard tricks. Well, people don't realize this. So if you don't know this, okay, just like uh, Margarita Falcone, if you're watching, they did some pictures outside. The whole time I'm watching you, but you can't see me because I'm inside. It is tinted. This guy literally walked by and looked towards me, looked within inches, this, this far. He looked right at me, and I like snap. He saw me. And he just kept going. He never saw me. So I got my camera out, and I have a lot of pictures, slow motion, regular motion, fast motion. I just took a lot of stuff, and I was just watching. Then they sat down and took a picture, and then I made it look real dark and gloomy, you know, kind of like, almost like criminal kind of thing, you know? And so I told Renzo, let's go. We got in our vehicles. We're going to go stop these guys. Hey, we're going to show them this picture. Say, have you seen these two guys? We've been having problems here at our church. Have you seen these two guys? And it was going to be a picture. But guess what? Our joy was busted because they were gone. They were already gone. But the point of this is this, that there's many times that, that you can see people, you can stand here, if you just want to people watch, just be here and watch the things that go on. They cannot see you, but you can see them. Let me tell you something, God is watching, right? It is only Jesus, and Jesus can, can see and know the things. Uh, for, for example, I'm going to tell you a story about a man who broke into a house one night. And he didn't want to steal anything, but he wanted to go in to get something, take something of value, something small. He wanted to go in and out, kind of, boom. But while he was searching through the stuff, after he got in this, in this home, he was searching the stuff, he heard a voice, and the voice said this, Jesus is watching you. He stopped for a moment and said to himself, man, uh, this must be the voice of my Sunday school teacher. He thought about his Sunday school lesson. Ah, there's no way. So, you know, he continued searching and to rob. And, and about five minutes later, he heard another voice that said, again, Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. He turned his, his flashlight to that direction and he saw a parrot. He saw a parrot. And he began to talk to this parrot. He said to the parrot, what is your name? And the parrot replied, it is Moses. Moses. The robber then said, what kind of silly, goofy, crazy name is that? And more than anything, what kind of person would ever name a parrot the name Moses? And the parrot looked up and he said, it is the same person who named the pit bull Jesus. You can laugh. It's funny. Oh, my God, there's a pit bull in there. His name is Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm here to tell you that it is only Jesus that, that can know everything. That is good news. It's not bad news. That's good news. Because, you know, I, I, that song, it is Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noon, and Jesus in the, in the night. He's always there for us. He's there with us 24-7. And there's a scripture in Philippians, if you'll turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, that, that, that gives us a great, great picture about, you know, that it is Jesus, it's, it's, it's only Jesus, it's, it's only Him. You know, when you get that, that encouragement, that word, that call, that text, that letter, that birthday wish, whatever, let me tell you something, man, give Jesus credit. It is Jesus that, that moves into us to pursue, to love others, and to do some special things to recognize that at that moment someone might need that text. Someone might need that welcome, that encouragement. But I'm here to tell you that it's only Jesus, and it's because of Jesus and what He did for us at the cross that we're able to be here by the grace of God. 
in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 11, gives us a great picture of who Jesus is. The Bible says in verse 7, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, when Jesus came and took this, this, this flesh, let me tell you something. The deity of God was all over. It was yet Jesus, the Son of God, but yet it was God. So the scripture says, who, though he was in the form of God, he did not e come count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But look what he did. Look what he did. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And, you know, even though he was a man, even though he knew he was yet God and the Son of God, that you know what? He emptied himself. He removed himself. And he takes the form of a servant. I think that's the greatest position that you could ever have. This is why our first responders, whether our nurses or doctors or our firemen or our police, these guys are servants to us. If you don't believe it, go check yourself into the hospital and find out who are the greatest servants. Nurses are my heroes, man. Every time I go to hospitals, I try to, on the way, I know they think I'm weird, but on the way in, on the way out, I tell all the nurses, thank you for all you do. Thank you for taking care of us. And that nurse might take care of you in the future. That nurse might have taken care of you. That doctor might have helped diagnose something to help you. Servants. That police officer, when you call 911, they show up, you're grateful. That fireman, when he, there's a fire or there's a situation where you need them, they show up. We are grateful. These are guys, these are servants. This is a high position. And Jesus empties himself by taking this form of a servant being born in the likeness of man. But watch this. Look at verse 8. And being found in human form, look what he did. Not only did he take the form of a servant, this is Jesus, only Jesus. He humbles himself. He humbles himself. And, and, and how does he do that? By becoming obedient, even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus could have came in a different form. He could have came in a different type of power. But he decides to come in a form of a servant. He becomes to come in a form of humility. And, and then he shows us the greatest picture that when you have servanthood in your life. Let me tell you something. When you have a life of, watch this, of, of, of a humility, you find yourself having a life, watch this, of obedience. Even to the death of the cross, Jesus gave us the greatest picture, only Jesus, the, how to live this life, to be a servant, to be humble, so that we can become obedient even to the death. And let me tell you something, the Bible says that we're all perishing, we're all perishing, we're all dying, but Jesus came for us. And because of that, the Bible says in verse 9, Therefore God, the Father, looks at the Son, and therefore God has highly exalted Him, and He bestowed on Him. He gave Him the name that is above all names. He gave Him that, that name. Why? Look in verse 10. Because when that name is called out, so that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Did you catch that? There is no place that you can hide from the eyes of Jesus. There is no place that you can hide from the presence of Jesus. And that's a good thing. And every tongue will confess one day that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will be only one name in history, in the, the history of mankind, in our future history. And that is this, that it's only one name that's going to be proclaimed. There is only one name that is going to be resound. It is the name of Jesus. It's very clear that one day, every kingdom, every president, every dictator, Every rich person, every person with big titles, every person with full of pride, every person that did not want to proclaim and did proclaim, we will all unanimously one day profess that He is Lord to the glory of the Father. It's a great picture. So, as a matter of fact, it's a beautiful picture in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. I want to take you there. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 7. The perfect seven verses, I believe. And the perfection is made in verse 7. I want you to see that. You know, the number 7, it means perfection. At the seventh day, God rested. Everything was perfect. 
He is perfect. Only He is perfect. It's a great story of the ascension. You remember after the, the death of, of, of the cross and, and Jesus was buried and, and the third day He arose from the grave and, and then He appeared. And before His ascension, watch this, what happens is, is something that's incredible. So if you're with me on, on Matthew chapter 17 verse 1, I want you to follow with me. Hopefully you are over there. Matthew chapter 17. Now I'm reading for the ESV, English Standard Version. The Bible says that after six days, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. He takes them. John was James's brother. And he led them up into a high mountain by themselves. Now picture this, they're in this high mountain and they're all by themselves. But look at verse 2, and he was transfigured. That means that, that Jesus was changed, he was, he was transformed before them. Transformation. And look at the description of what Jesus looks like. Remember, the last time they saw Jesus was when? It was on the cross. Guys, you understand, they had just seen their, their, their hero. They had just seen the greatest miracle maker. They had just seen the one that proclaimed that he was the Son of God, that he was life to mankind. The one that said, you know what, come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The one that said at the cross, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The one that said to the other robber because he had a transformation in his life and said to them, he said, today you will be with me in paradise because you recognize me as the son of God. It doesn't matter that you came to the point of death and you were in sin and you lived a life that was so wicked and so far. But yet today you will be in paradise with me because there was a moment that this thief saw Jesus differently. And he saw him as his Savior, and he asked for forgiveness. And we know that he did because there was an example in his life. Because no, not only now what, what was he uh, accusing Jesus, but now because he was transformed, now this robber was protecting, was trying to defend, was speaking up for Jesus. Because the other thief said, hey, you know what? If he is the Jesus, if he is this, let him free us and, and let him free himself. But you know what he said? This man has done no wrong. It is us. So he had a new kind of talk, a new kind of vocabulary. There was a new wall because it was Jesus. Only Jesus can do that to a man. Only Jesus can do that to a woman, a teenager, a child. It is Jesus. There's a transformation. And look what Jesus looks now. What he looks like now. The Bible says that right before them they saw his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became as white as light. Wow, Jesus' face shined like the sun. And now Jesus' clothes have become white as the light. Isn't that what Jesus reminds us? Isn't that what he had told him? He said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Isn't that what he told him? Well, he's not just telling him, he's showing him his face, his glory, his glory, his transformation. Back into his heavenly place. He's fixing to go to be with the Father. And his face looks like the sun. Have you ever looked at the sun? Not for long, right? You're driving. The sun is setting. hits you as you're going west. In the morning as you're driving, going east as it rises. That sun. And imagine, it's not just his face that looks like the sun, but his clothes, they become white as light. We just changed some lights out here from real old yellow dingy lights, floodlights, and now we have LED lights. We have been transformed to LED. And you understand the difference between, oh, yucky yellow lights, which we thought they were amazing when they first came out, because that's all we had. There was not an option. But there's options now, LED. It costs you a little bit more, but down the road, the payoff is incredible. Let me tell you something. It costs the Son of God a lot. As a matter of fact, it costs Him everything. And because of that, now we get to be in the light as He is in the light. We get to walk with Jesus Christ. I love what happened next. I love what happens next. Stay with me. So as we go on, look at verse 3. And behold, there were appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him. So who's on the scene now? Now it's Moses 
is now Elijah, and, and now he sees Jesus. You know, Peter, James, and John are looking at Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. But let me remind you, only Jesus. Scripture says that and Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're, we are here now. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So Peter, though, just thinking ahead. He's always getting ahead of himself, speaking out loud. So he sees three people now. He sees Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. He says, hey, I, I will make you a tent. We'll make you a place. So they thought they were just going to reside with him and just chill overnight. But No. God had a greater plan. He was going to give them the Holy Spirit to indwell with them. Because even Jesus could only be play one place at one time because he was in the flesh. But now he was going to give us the great helper, that is the Holy Spirit, to be with us at all times. In verse 5, he, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud shattered over them. And a voice from the cloud said, watch this, look who shows up. The Father shows up. The Father comes in the picture now. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. God the Father is pleased with His Son. Jesus the Father commands them to listen to His Son. If God the Father tells Peter, James, and John that you should listen to His Son, what should we do? We should listen to the Son. We should listen to the Son and only Jesus and just Jesus. But it goes on to say that not only does He, does he, does he tells us, that, look, look at in verse, um, uh, what was that, uh, 5. As a cloud overshadowed, He said, This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to them. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces. They were terrified. But Jesus came and He touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but who? But Jesus only. Isn't that wonderful? That all they saw was Jesus. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. So where is Moses? Where is Elijah? When you get to heaven, there's a lot of people that say, well, you know what? I'm going to ask God how, about this question. I'm going to ask him about this doctrinal question. I'm gonna, all that stuff is not going to matter. You're not even going to want to look for Jesus, Peter, James, and John. No one. Moses, no one. Elijah, no one. You know who you're going to want to see? I want to see Jesus. Isn't He the one that gave His life for you? And He will be there at the right hand of God. You see, what we see in this scripture, what we see in this event that took place, they saw no man except Jesus only. This was all they wanted to see for their comfort because they were afraid. And who's the one that came? Did Moses come and comfort them? Did Elijah come and comfort No, it was Jesus that came down. Moses was gone and, and he could give them no comfort. Eli Elias was now gone and he had no word of consolation. Yet when Jesus said, be not afraid, their fear vanished. And my friend, today Jesus is still speaking to us and he says, don't be afraid and your fears will vanish. You see, don't go to Moses, don't go to Elias, because neither the old covenant nor the prophecy go straight to Jesus only. Go to Jesus, because He was the entire Savior they wanted, and they go and see Jesus. Peter, James, and John, every one of those three men needed washing away from their sin. They needed to be cleansed from their sin. They all needed to be kept. They all needed to be held on their way. But neither Moses and neither Elijah could have washed them from sin. Do you understand that? Not even have kept them from returning to it. Now here's two principles that are important. Because Jesus washes us from sin, He can also keep us from returning to sin. You get that? But Moses and Elias, they, they could not do that. So the source is this. The answer is this. It is Jesus. But Jesus only could cleanse them. And He did. Christ could lead them on. And He did. But we thank God we have seen Jesus only. Jesus only is enough for our comfort. And I'm telling you, that's it. That's the key. That's the key to life. I'm going to go a little deeper to us. 
Let's bring it to us. Let's bring it to us to our life because we're so good and so quick to say, that's a sinner. That's a, that's a real sinner. Oh, that's a heavy sinner. There's no real sinners. There's not a, a, a bigger sinner. There's not a heavy sinner. You know what they are? They're sinners. Do you know the church is full of sinners? The Bible says, listen, who are you kidding? The Bible says, for we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's a gap. We've all tried to reach God. Man, we, man, we just tried it. There's a gap. We just cannot reach. We just cannot reach him. But Jesus came to fill that gap when he died on the cross and he demonstrated his love for us and towards us. He did that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. You know what that does? He becomes, watch this, he becomes that bridge. You see that? Can you see the, 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 on the camera? That's all you see. He becomes that bridge. And because of Jesus' death on the cross, it, because it is only Jesus and Jesus alone, watch this, he made an, a, a way. He gave us access to the Father. So when we trust and we no longer are here, we have died, we have turned from our sins, we have turned out to God. But it was only, and it is only through Jesus Christ. It's a great story about that. It's a great story, a clear picture of sinners and how Jesus acted when he was with sinners, when he saw sinners and how we should respond, how we should react, how we should act. And it's very clear in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Bible says it's Jesus passed. And there's two stories within this verse. This is phenomenal. It's like it goes from here, pause, here, and then come back. You ever seen these movies when they're, they're fighting, but there's two, three scenes? Like, I think it's Lord of the Rings. They're fighting over here, da, da, da. And then they're over here with the trees. I said, get back to the fight over here. I want to see the, I want to see the end of the story. And then come back to, you know, Frodo or something else. And this kind of happens here. The Bible says as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to them, follow me. He said to him, follow me. And what did Matthew do? The Bible says that he arose and he followed. He didn't question. He arose, he got up, and he followed Jesus. That was the day that God called him. Today, today, it might be the day that God calls you. Today is the day when you hear his voice. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. And when you hear his voice, you should follow him because great things he will show you and greater things will you do in his name if you follow him. Matthew follows him. Look at verse 10. And Jesus, and as Jesus reclined, he was sitting, leaning at the table in the house. Behold, many, a lot of tax collectors. Let me stop there. Tax collectors in those days were not seen very well. As a matter of fact, they were cheaters. They were liars. They were extortioners. Okay? So they were not buried. They were considered at the top of the top of the brand of sinners. Okay? But look at this. Many tax electors. He's with many tax electors. And, he, and, and, and sinners. There's a lot of tax electors. A lot of sinners. And, 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 and they all were coming. And they come around Jesus. And they were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. In other words, they were doing light to light. They were hanging out. They were conversing. They had a little group party. They definitely were not social distancing. That place was packed with sinners and tax collectors, the disciples, and Jesus is there. And who pops in there? Oh, religious, religious leaders pop in, the Pharisees. Verse 11 says that when the Pharisees saw this, they, they, they came and they, they got the disciples. They whispered to them and they said to the disciples, here's a question that they asked. Why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? Why does he do that? Because in their eyes, in their eyes, this is wrong. Why are you doing this? But when he heard it, he said, who heard it? Everybody say Jesus. Right there where you at, say Jesus. When Jesus heard this, because Jesus sees everything. It is Jesus, only Jesus. He can see, he can hear, he knows. And when he heard this, he turns to them. He turns to these snakes, these vipers, as he addressed them before. And he says to them, those who are well, they don't need a physician. Those that are healthy, they don't need a doctor. But those who are sick. See, Jesus got it. Jesus understood it. He he went and he was with these men. 
and even women that were lost in their sins and their ways and I mean whether they were tattooed or they were in prison or they were drug addicts or they were murderers or they were whatever they were whatever you want to classify them whatever you want to put put it on there put the label on there remove the label because Jesus is coming and when Jesus comes, he sees people that are sick. So he's going to go to the sick. He's not going to go to the hole. He's not going to go to so church. It's not about us making this a social club, a little gathering every Sunday and Wednesday. It's about going in our every day and looking for the sick, the ones that need Jesus, only Jesus. Look at verse 13. He says this, go and learn that what this means. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but I came to call the sinner. So if you're thinking, if you're listening right there in your living room, in your car, right here in the auditorium, you're thinking, man, I don't know that God can change my life. It, it, you don't understand. You don't know who I am. You, you don't know the kind of person. You don't know my thought life. You don't know my intentions. You don't know my crimes. You don't know. You have no idea about my history. And you're telling me that I can be saved and I can be changed. Yes, but only Jesus can do that. Yes, you can. Because the Bible clearly says that Jesus said this. You know what? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This is why he tells us over and over, reminds us that, you know what, if you want to give gifts and your offerings, that's good. Thank you for giving your money. Thank you for giving your time. But you know what? I'd rather you leave those and give yourself to me. Obe obey me. Follow me. Obey me. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. You could sacrifice yourself till you're blue in the face, till you die. You could serve and do all these good things and good deeds. Good people do good deeds. Christians do good deeds. But are we doing God's will? Are we be, being obedient? And that's where the transformation comes. When he looks at sinners, God changes lives. He changes our attitude. He changes our mind. He changes our mentality. So yes, it is only Jesus for sinners. But it's not just sinners because within that story, we, look, we jump to verse 18. And the Bible says that while he was saying these things, while he was saying these things, with all these people to these religious leaders and his disciples the Bible says while he was saying these things to them behold a ruler came in and he knelt before them saying my daughter has died in the midst of all this in the midst of Jesus being the word and speaking the word and being himself being the bread of life and being the light into a dark place in the midst of this look at this man he's got this pastor thing man and here comes another person I need help and what does the good shepherd do? He turns. He turns. It says that this man, this ruler came. He kneels before him in humility. My daughter had just died. Why do you think this man did that? Why? Because he knew that only Jesus, it is Jesus, only Jesus that could do something. But come and lay your hand on her and she will live. You know what? He was, his faith was so incredible that, that as he was, he didn't look at the event. He didn't go in there to criticize Jesus. He burst the scene. He gets on his knees and he says this, this ruler, this, he humbled himself of his name, whatever his, his name and who he was known of. And, and he humbled himself and he, and he says, man, my, my daughter has died. And I know Jesus. I know only Jesus, you. If only you can come and you can touch my daughter, I know that she will live. I know that that's exactly what he, he says. And in verse 19, the most glorious, glorious part of this, look at this, and Jesus rose. He got up from the crowds and where he was, and he follows him. He makes the time. He makes a sacrifice. This is why I tell you it's very important to stop, listen, and react. Very simple. We need to stop. We need to listen to the voice of God and what he wants to do, and we need to react to that situation. If there's a need, we need to stop. We need to listen to God. What do you want me? How do you want me to help fulfill this need? And now you need to react. You got to do something about it. It's not good enough just to stop. It's not good enough just to stop and just listen. Okay, a lot of people do that. But the hardest thing is now you got to be obedient, right? You got to react. Matthew reacted. He followed Jesus. And Jesus does this. He gives a good example. He stops what he's doing. He arises and he follows him. See that? He stops, he listens, and he follows him. Not only him, but his disciples follow the disciples fall. In verse 20, we get interrupted. There's another story within the story. Here we go. We're going back and forth. 
as they're going to go and minister to this man's daughter and to fulfill a need, the Bible says, And behold, a woman who has suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. In other words, she had been hemorrhaging. She had been bleeding for 12 years. Do you think she was sick? That's right. See, Jesus, only Jesus is for the dying. And she was sick. But she had so much faith that she, if she could just get in there and just touch his robe, just touch a portion of it, just touch it, she knew that she would be healed. And verse 21 says, For she said to herself, this is what she said. She didn't say it out loud. She spoke to herself. She thought, she said, If I could only touch his garment, I will be made well. You know, you could whisper. You could not move your lips and just cry out to God without no one knowing right now. You're thinking, God, have mercy on my life. And Jesus hears you because Jesus hurt her. In verse 22, Jesus turns. Once again, he stops, he turns, and he ministers. And seeing her, he said this. He says, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. So Jesus, on the way to revive, to heal, he stops to minister to someone else. And then he finally gets to, we get back to the other scene, verse 23. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house, he saw the flute players in the crowd making a, a commotion. You know, it was just, it was a funeral already. There was a funeral taking place. He said, go away. He told him, leave. What are you doing here? Are you having a, why are you having a funeral? Why are you having a funeral? Go away. For the girl is not dead, but she's sleeping. In the eyes of Jesus, she was just asleep. And they laughed at him. And many will laugh at you. Many will laugh at you. Whenever you go to minister to people in the name of Jesus, many will laugh at you. Many will laugh at you because you pray. Many will laugh at you because you trust. Many will laugh at you because of your faith. Many will laugh at you because you go to a church and, and you give up your Sunday and you sacrifice yourself and you go and you could rest it. But many will laugh. But don't worry about that. They laughed at Jesus. Verse 25, but when the crowd had been put outside. I love that. I, I, I underline that. When you do the will of God, when Jesus did the will of the Father, and He was obedient, He wasn't worried about the, the Pharisees. Out of the way. He wasn't worried about this crowd. The Bible says that, but when the crowd had been put outside, I think it was Peter, man. I think we just kicked everybody out. I think when the crowd was put outside, He went in and He took her by the hand and the girl arose. She got up. And the report of this went through all the district. In other words, the word got out and it got in the region. It got all over the place that Jesus, only Jesus had done what he did. Incredible. Incredible. Guys, we need to look at scripture. We need to look at the gospel. Understand, this is not a story of the past. This is a God of today. This is the son of Jesus of today. This still goes on because our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. God doesn't change. The Son will never change. The Holy Spirit is definitely not going to change. They're going to be who they're called to be. They're going to be who they are. And they're going to come and call us and challenge us into a place of obedience. As we close today, look at this scripture in Ephesians chapter 2. If I don't show you this, it's almost like, well, where's the hope? I mean, we heard the story. We know what he did, but what, how do we apply that to us? How do we bring it back where it affects me? Because preacher, you, you have no idea of my life. You have no idea where I've been, what I've done, but Jesus does, and he's ready to meet you. He's willing to sit with you even though you're not worth it. And I wasn't worth it. We're dark in our dark nature, in our dark life. We're in a dark world. We're searching for him, jumping up and down from theology and trying to figure out this thing in life from being a, a, a supposedly a follower of Christ. And now we're an atheist and, and we just don't know. But Ephesians chapter 2 brings it all back to us. And it says, but God, but God. Being rich in his mercy because of the great love which he loved us. Let me repeat that. God has got plenty. He's rich. He's very rich in mercy. And because of a, not just a love, a great love which he loved you and me with. 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. And it is by grace that you have been saved. And it is only Jesus. It's just Him. You know what that means? You know what that tells us today? That there's hope. There, there, there is hope. There's hope here today. There's hope. And the hope is this, because God's being so rich, He's so abundant, He's got so plenty of mercy. And because of His great love that He demonstrated through us, through His Son, and showed us His love through His Son. Even though we were dead in our trespasses, even though we were against Him and we were His enemy, He has reconciled it. He's bringing us back and for a purpose so that we can be alive together with Christ. Because people, if you think that you're living a life and you are not living with Christ, you are not living. You're dead. The Bible says that you are dead in your trespasses. We were all dead in our trespasses. I was dead in my trespasses until I gave my life to Jesus. Then I became alive through Christ. Then we saw that we came because Jesus is life. He is the resurrection. And it is all by the grace of God. It is by grace that we have been saved. None of us deserve it. None of us deserve it. What we deserve is hell. That's what we deserve. Matter of fact, give Bible study on Wednesday. I'm going to close it out with this. Just imagine a glass half full of water. Imagine a glass half full of water. Now, there's two perspectives, right? You could come up to the glass full of water. Maybe somebody hands you a glass. You're thirsty, and someone hands you a glass just half full of water. And there's two perspectives. You could have the attitude to say, man, that's all they gave me? Cheapskakes. For Monterrey, there must be all those tight holding on to their water. Sorry about that. But no, we're not, okay? Half, you can look at that with perspective. Only a half a glass of water? That's it? That's all I get? Or you can look at it and understand that it's the grace of God. That you can look at the perspective. Look at the half glass of water and say, you know what? I'm going to focus on the half glass of water, the bottom portion. Thank God, by the grace of God, I get to have some, some water. I get to quench my thirst. I'm great. I want to be grateful for this. And this is how we are in life. We look at life and we want this and we want this and we want this. And we think that we're supposed to be given this and we earn this and we deserve this. And, and maybe we have this or just this or maybe even this. But let me tell you what we do deserve. We deserve a glass with one drop of God's wrath and His judgment. And if all you had is one drop of God's wrath and judgment, it would terrify you. And all hope is lost. But God being rich in His mercy, He removes that. And He becomes the living water in your soul. He becomes the living water. And He offers and He tells you, you know what? When you come to me, I'm going to give you life and I'm going to give it to you abundantly. And what you see, you think you see, you don't see it all. Because once you are in Christ and Christ is in you and the grace of God befalls upon you, I don't care if you think it looks like this. When you get in the presence of God, He is the living water and He overflows. That's why King David says, my cup overfloweth. Because you get into the glory of God. You get in the presence of God. You, you, you get into that, that, that relationship with God. And you realize now everything that you had, man, it was a gift from God. Everything good that you have, the Bible says, everything good and perfect comes from a heaven above. And you start seeing life in a very different way. You start saying, you know what, I thank God for that. I thank God. You know what, I might not have a full tank of gas today, but I have a car that I could put a full, I have a full tank of gas in my car. Does that make sense? I might, I might not have got, you know, the, the order right. How many times you go into a drive-thru, you ordered a burger. Yesterday I ordered a fish sandwich and I thought I ordered fries and I had no fries. And I could have had an attitude, man, I didn't get my fries. But instead I said, oh, thank God I didn't get those fries. Got to lose some weight. I don't need that. Or they didn't give you a Coke. They give you the wrong flavor. You don't like it. Well, now you don't have to drink that Coke. See, it's how you look at life. It's perspective. Today, there was at McDonald's. And I know I'm done. I, keep, I, like, I like life stories. Went to the drive-thru. And I saw somebody throw something at the cashier to the drive-thru. And I'm the kind of guy that I hate for people to get disrespected, especially if it's a young person at the drive-thru and you got an older person doing it. And I was like, I'm ready to go in there and say something. And I was, right away I drove up and they said, wait, what happened? What, did they throw something? He goes, yeah. Well, we rejected her money. It was a $5 bill, but it was a half of, it was all chewed up. It was in pieces. We couldn't accept it. 
and she threw it at him. You understand? She threw it at him like it was not nothing. And just total disrespect. And it was saddened. Sometimes God comes. And he did through his son. And he came to us. What, what would he speak? We start in Philippians. He came to us as a form of a servant. He came very humble. And you know what we did? We just rejected him. We rejected him. And even today, people are still rejecting God's son. And still rejecting God's son. Now, understanding that, you know what? That, that $5 bill, it still had value. But my mama had to clean it up, fix it up. Maybe somebody will take it. And if nobody takes it, it'll be a good story to remember. But I'm here to tell you that you're valuable. And God has purpose for your life. And unless you turn to Jesus, don't you think that your life's going to change? Your life will never change. Never change. Well, maybe it does. It could change for the worse. Because we're dying. As the band plays, as we go to a prayer time right now, in a moment of prayer, I want you to look at this. I want you to look today. I want you to look at your life. Look at your soul. Look at you. You know, if today was the last day of the, that you were called to live, if today was it, if today was it, that if you knew that's it, what change would you, what would you want to leave this place to do? What would you want to go? Maybe ask somebody for forgiveness. Maybe change some things in your life. Maybe give a little bit more. I don't know what you would do, but I tell you what, I would pray and hope the first thing you would do is that you would look to Jesus and only to Jesus because He's the one that can help you. He's the one that can give you eternal life. He's the one that can forgive you. He's the one that can transform you. He's the one that can take all the guilt and all the pain and put it behind you. He can take all the circumstance that you're in, the danger, the uncertainty, all of that stuff, that pandemic in your life of sin and worry. He can put all that to the side and you'll look at him and you'll see his light so shine. And when he comes in you, you'll become the light of the world. And the reason you'll become a light of the world because you will now be able to manifest the Father in you, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And you can say, God is real. He is alive. I know because He lives in me. Therefore, I will wake up every day now looking to how to obey my Master. And when I do that, my life will be different. My life will be different. If today God is speaking to you, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer. If you've never given your life to Jesus, say, Father God, I recognize that I have messed up my life. My life is a wreckage. Father, I'm trying to find fulfillment in other things, things of this world and relationships and, and circumstances in my job, in my career, and, and Father God, in, in my kids, Lord, in my house, with the things that I have, God. But today, I acknowledge, God, that those things are nothing. They will waste away. The only thing that's going to last is your word. And today, I accept you as my word. I accept you as my Savior. Come in my life. Change my life. Heal me. Forgive me, transform me, God. Father, I need you so much. I need you desperately, God. So confused. I'm so exhausted. I'm so tired, Father. I'm tired of being sick and tired, God. I need a refreshment. Father, I need some water, the living water, God. I need to be sustained by the bread of life today, Lord. Come into my life, God. I'm not perfect, God. I'm a sinner. But because of that, Lord, I claim to you and ask for mercy on my life. I ask you to save me. Forgive me, Lord. I believe and trust in your, your son that he died for me on the cross. I believe that he arose from the grave. And I put my confidence in him, Lord. And I thank you. Save me, Jesus. Save me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer today, before you leave, you need to let me know. You need to let me know. If you pray that prayer, if you're watching this right now, you need to send me a message. Let us know so that we can help give you the help, the encouragement that you're going to need to walk this new life in Jesus Christ. God.